evening. Welcome to the curriculum committee meeting for October 11. Um, courtesy of the floor for agenda items only. Seeing none, um, are there any discussion items, Dr. Silver? Thank you very much, Mrs. Sigler. Hello, everybody. A couple of items today in the curriculum committee. Uh, the first being 3.01 discussion item U.S. history. Uh, that came up last month, as you remember, uh, Mr. Antalix asked a question about our instruction of American history. And this is particularly uh, timely given a lot of the discussion across our country about critical race theory, or CRT as I'll re uh, refer to it. I mean, I hate to mention CRT in that. I believe it's a non-constructive political term that has become too familiar in the past few months as a catch-all backlash against some districts' diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts. <clears throat> but to put it succinctly, we don't teach CRT, and neither does any other school district that I'm aware of. CRT is a research framework that was created at the Harvard Graduate School uh, to investigate sociological frameworks for why there continues to be racism even after the Civil Rights Acts of the 1960s. It was more of an inquiry for research. CRT has nothing to do with how Bethlehem schools teach American history as our national quest for a more perfect union. That's how we teach it. Let me be clear, we do teach the harm of racism to American society and American people, but we also show how well-known and often hidden American figures, black and white, have made tremendous contributions to make our country fairer and more just. To make sure that we have those tragedies and triumphs organized <clears throat> in the eight instructional units of our grade eight and grade nine curriculum, we enlisted Maureen Leeson to lead a group of teachers, eighth grade, ninth grade teachers, to develop a comprehensive pacing guide that aligns the district's rich discovery textbook curriculum and the uh, accompanying resources. Those eight instructional units are the way the College Board organizes the eight periods of American history. We divide four of them for ninth grade, or four of them for eighth grade, and four of them for ninth grade. So it's a logical way of laying out the content for your pacing guide in the course. I'll ask Maureen to share a little bit about the work that she led, but first I want to direct you to the document in your packet. I wish I had had this document when I was teaching American history um, um, ages ago. It gets into not some of the many of the familiar historical topics that you're familiar with, landmarks in American history and our, our uh, quest for a more perfect union, but it also includes some of those hidden figures and some of those lesser known events that many times have been deliberately excluded from the historical record. <clears throat> we bring both of those together in the uh, pacing guide in front of you with a handy uh, resource links that connect to the discovery tech book and all of its resources. So we try to make it handy for teachers. Maureen, could you tell us a little bit about that process that you followed this summer? With pleasure. Um, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to see all of you. Um, first up, I want to kind of show you organizationally where do we start. So as Dr. Silva referenced, uh, it's broken down into time periods. You can see that in every time period we have one activity related to painful, often hidden historical events related to racism and discrimination. We also have at least you know, one activity related to inspiring events or national accomplishments against racism and discrimination. We have accompanying readings. And then we, we said there's so much here that we can't just stop. So we had some optional activities that we included as well, which were additional instructional readings. So, <clears throat> I want to acknowledge that this is a step in the right direction, but it certainly is a long journey. We certainly could have rewritten the entire curriculum, and this is not a rewrite of the entire curriculum. We maintained our existing US curriculum, and we are adding to it. We're adding value to our US history curriculum. All the resources came directly from the Discovery Ed Education textbook, and that was intentional. We're using the resource that we purchased, that we you know, scrutinized before purchasing, and everything came from the Discovery Education Tech Book. A couple of the highlights I'd like to share with you is, for instance, um, you know, we had intentionally applied a more comprehensive lens to events like the Revolutionary War, where we're highlighting Crispus Attucks, who was one of the first black soldiers in the Revolutionary War and deemed a hero when he died in the Boston Massacre. Um, 
from the eyes of Crispus Atticus, we consider, we consider, you know, as students, what was it like to be a black soldier fighting for the Patriots? Um, a more common thing that maybe as you read through the document, you said, oh, yeah, I recognize that, is we're intentionally teaching students about Juneteenth. For years and years, we've taught students about the Emancipation Proclamation. Well, we want to make sure that we're also talking about when enslaved Texans learn that they were free nearly two years after uh, the Emancipation Proclamation. And then lastly, uh, another highlight I'd share with you is if you ask any kid in, in, walking around Bethlehem area school districts who was the first man to walk on the moon, I'm sure a lot of people would say Neil Armstrong, and that, that's a really obvious thing. Well, I think, you know, again, we're a, a highlight, one of those hidden figures we want to make sure we're teaching kids about Dr. Mae Jemison, who was the first black woman who uh, was uh, an astronaut in space. So uh, those are just a couple of the highlights. Uh, it's very comprehensive. And uh, again, I would admit that our teachers are on a long journey of making sure that we're doing justice to the US history curriculum and, and to our students. Thank you very much, Maureen. And you're right, the work continues. It's never done in this area, as is in all of American history, because it keeps unfolding. But I'd like to thank you and your team for the work that they've done to get us on the same page of this important topic. So uh, I'm very comfortable reporting to you that we, we talk about the subjects that students talk about whether they hear them in our class or not. And we give historical context and we give supporting ideas. Um, but we also bring forth uh, many of the ideas from American history as we've always been inspired by them. So a more inclusive and a more just form of American history. Um, I, would, I, I, I don't know if this, I think it's a question, but it may turn into a suggestion. Are there any resources or any thoughts in as, as you all look to implement this on ways that you can tie in local, like how do we make, you know, considering, considering where we're located, you know, 1741, how we can tie some of those things into kids so they can see that it's real and tangible and, you know, the tagline, history happened here too. I mean, you do, when we have the opportunity to bring in local figures, who, maybe who aren't just directly involved in the uh, history of the time, although some are, but also some of our own Bethlehem institutions that go back very far and have had a pretty limited type of conversation about how it was influential in the time and with all the different types of Americans. That's why Maureen, I think, really hit hard on the Revolutionary War and you know, the periods where you think about America's beginning. Frequently, you know, that does not include many people of color in that, in that story. So yeah, local institutions, local people who were involved in it, uh, whenever you have the chance to bring it in, we, we welcome that. Well, you can count on this sort of like the red, yellow, and orange leaves on Sycamore Street at this time, <laughs> at this time of month because a uh, little context, as you know, the, the school board does have uh, responsibility over program of studies. Uh, in Bethlehem, we uh, annually bring all of the changes to the uh, high school program of studies to this committee for its review and approval. We don't bring every single course because there's hundreds of them to the school board, but we definitely annually, annually keep you up to date as far as what are the directions in our new courses, our deletion of courses, and what, what seems to be getting greater uh, addition or amplification within uh, what we teach our kids in high school. Obviously, the most important overall goal is that our students are leaving liberty and freedom, college and career ready. <clears throat> but what does that mean exactly? That process is fleshed out in the high school program of studies development timeline, and you know how to read this from the bottom up. Uh, we start developing the 22-23, which is next year's program, now so that we can have board approval, do the budgeting process, and then do the curriculum <laughs> development in the spring and the summer so that needed changes are ready for the fall. But the, uh, this, the, really the conversations about the program of study happened as soon as the previous program of study was uh, finished. 
and we talk about what we, we would like to bring and add more of. That process, uh, this year, as far as our strategic initiatives are, uh, we want to maintain our common POS between liberty and freedom because best practice is best practice and opportunities that kids have. Doesn't mean that they're identical, but we should have in all of our core programs uh, equal opportunity for liberty and freedom students. We want to uh, support our JEDI or our DEI and justice, uh, our equity uh, goals along with the talent development and the tracking goals where we want to make sure that our students are uh, all of our students are having access to their uh, most rigorous <coughs> curriculum. As you know, we've developed a lot of our courses in Career Pathways, a four-year program where students will take a four-course sequence that adds up into something that might be an interest for them in their post-secondary world. Traditionally, uh, Career Pathways have been the realm of vocational technical schools and they learn in their cluster and then they get their shingle and then they're ready to go but a good modern high school has developed them in the academic areas. So we have a four course sequence, as you know, in Project Lead the Way Engineering. We have it in Biomedicine. Uh, we have it in Arts and Communications. We have it in Law. And most recently, last year, we added the uh, uh, pathway for education to help grow our own for people who might be interested in careers in education. So we want to increase the number of students starting at the beginning of the pathway because that's where success is made. You can't wait too long. So part of our goal is to double our student enrollment in the beginning of those pathways so that they're, uh, they're hooked and they're ready to go and they have enough time to plan their direction through school. Uh, we want to um, increase our enrollment in AP Computer Science because we're finding that course uh, is underutilized and by moving it into ninth grade where it is offered in many school districts across the country for ninth graders we believe will increase it and our students do have a computer science requirement which this would obviously satisfy. A little bit of uh, forward-leaning stuff we're seeing a lot of emphasis not just in uh, high school programs of studies and not just in career and vocational tracks but also in SATs, ACTs and things like data science. Uh, it now makes up 30% of the ACT, so having students, and there's, I have nothing against Algebra 1, Algebra 2, and Geometry, and Trigonometry, perfectly good disciplines of math. The modern data science and the present uh, the manipulation of large data sets and the ability to compress and bring meaning from data is a mathematical skill that we're looking at, as well as the, that often uh, leads to the topics of artificial intelligence and how that's influencing not just the ethical decisions that we're making. I saw in 60 minutes last night how uh, AI is increasing, you know, the way we represent people, um, but um, also in every other area. So we want to put our toe in the water as far as data science and artificial intelligence. And of course, we want to, along with planting those new flowers, pull any weeds of courses that have not been offered for a while so that we have room in our program of study and limit our course conflicts. We also will uh, be using this program of study to add any type of information related, related to the assessment and grading work that we're doing that's ongoing uh, so that students know of that as they're taking their courses and their plans through high school. So it's, I would say, you know, I always uh, tell Maureen and, uh, and, uh, and Tara and the department chairs, you know, on, on the Richter scale of zero to 10, as far as educational earthquake, this is, this is a two. You know, it's not, uh, it's not a big, it's more of a, recognition that we, here's where we are. We're working on other things like literacy at the secondary level, we're looking at assessment, and our program of study over years has gotten, it's pretty good. You know, it's, it's pretty directed, pretty effective. Now it's time to make sure that we're getting students into it equitably, we're addressing some key areas, and we're doing so in a, in a way that improves student achievement. So we worked our way up to October 11th, which is this update to the Board Curriculum Committee. Thank you for, for that. I don't know if there are any additional priorities or any concerns you have about any of the priorities. If so, we have a full month to work them out because uh, on November 3rd, we'll be uh, sending you the program of studies changes, just the changes that uh, would be uh, planned for our next meeting to review. And then Tara and Maureen, who have been working very hard with the department chairs and all the teachers in the different departments, will be joining me on November the 8th to make those presentations with an eye on 
uh, the November voting meeting on the 22nd to approve the program of study so we can get started on it and uh, begin the budgeting process. areas for interest in electives. Pathways are just a little bit more intense groupings of courses that build upon each other that really lead to a very specific career or college direction. But there's still room for courses that are of interest that high school kids like, and those are still in the program. So. Can I throw one out really quick? Sorry, I, when I was in high school, way back in the day, I had a class on the Vietnam War. On the, the Vietnam War. We have a lot of historical, we have a lot of electives in school, uh, in the history department that are, I wouldn't call them, uh, high, I would call them more niche or high interest topics. So yeah, there's still room and there's still room. It was just one of the most incredible, and, and I think so much of it has to do with the teacher presenting the information. Mm -hmm. But like even to Mrs. Clody, you know, always told me you thank every veteran when you see them. And to this day, I'll be at the gas station thanking the veterans because mm -hmm. Mrs. Clody, um, it was just such, like, a, I hate to sound cliche, but like a life-changing class, so. That's my three cents. Mm -hmm. Check which war electives we're all trying. <laughs> well, especially as, a, no, it's more you know, relevant. like my generation. Yeah. No, it's more relevant. And many, you don't really know about mm -hmm. that time period, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just had a quick question. You mentioned about the detracking goals, because I know we talked about this a while ago. I think that Freedom had condensed what had been three levels into two for a number of courses. And Liberty, we were going to get to, and I think that was pre-pandemic maybe. I don't know if that's included. That's what that, that, is. So, that so we're getting Liberty with this one. That's finishing yeah, what we started. Finishing what had already been started. It was sort of the last. Awesome. Thank you. And just to be clear, there's still there's the AP and the honors, which would count as one one. Correct. That's so some people count them as two, but um, depending Correct. on the school you go to. That's in the program. That's in the current program of studies, and that'll right. be the same as well. Yeah, there are still uh, electives that are going to have extra weighting, like advanced placements, whether they're tracks or not. When you get to high school, more of the courses are are uh, chosen instead of you know you're, you qualify for a particular program. You choose, you choose your courses. But there are a couple that's like English, and there have been yeah. freedom with that down to sort of two choices for English. Math. Right. In the course, you're talking the course subjects, yeah. and, that's and we're completing that this year. That's fantastic. Thank you. That's great. Okay. Mr. Uh, thank you. What thoughts have been given to, so in talking about all of these changes that will be made, understanding changes mean that things will be different. And when things are different, there's a learning curve. So what thoughts have been given to make sure that um, particularly our teachers, particularly those teachers who have taught a certain way or certain courses for a certain number of time, and so this will be a very different change for them. What ways are we going to be supporting them through these? We, uh, once we know what our program of studies are and what the course changes are going to be, part of the process is uh, pursuing the materials and the professional development strategies that are necessary for the implementation of that course. So for instance, when you know, if we we're adding a course or revising a course, for instance, significantly revising a course, take American history a few years ago, when we bring in new, new material like the Discovery Tech book, training goes along with that. So if there's a significant uh, professional learning uh, need related to a course, that's, that's why we put it in the budget. That we know that has to be there. But not unusual. Uh, best example I can give is the Project Lead the Way, where many times the, that teacher, especially if you're in a course like engineering or biomedicine, which isn't just science or it isn't just math or it isn't just health, but it requires a blending of content and subject areas, then you're guaranteeing that there's a rigorous uh, training for being able to implement that curriculum. In some cases, if the elective was suggested by a teacher, they're already ready, willing, and able to do that, uh, do that work. But if it's a change, we're going to have to, uh, uh, that is significant, where we're going to have to bring on some new learning for a faculty member, it's our responsibility to do that training. So on this list, again, 
on the Richter scale to two, uh, the introduction of data science or artificial intelligence, if we have a moment and we run that course, uh, whatever teacher one is, ends up teaching it, uh, would, I'm guessing, need additional opportunities for professional development. Other than that, there's not a lot here. Our, our focus is going to be more around literacy in the content area for all teachers next year, um, and not so much new courses. Yeah. Yeah, there'll be enough of assessment and grading and literacy. Every teacher is going to be learning professionally. Now, it's not just related to the program studies, but our in service, our activity, our continuing work. Thank you. Next up is 3.03 social, social emotional learning update. Well, for that, I'm calling in the experts, our pupil services department. As you know, Claire Hogan is our pupil services chief, and Tracy Herner has recently joined the pupil services department with Claire as sort of our supervisor of social emotional learning, a topic which, you know, uh, front and center right now in the post pandemic, in our pandemic uh, planning, but also. Uh, and just our normal operation of how we reach students and we have uh, healthier and more successful students. So with that, I'll turn it over to Ms. Tobin. Well, good evening, everybody. Um, so if, Teresa, you can go to the next, so thank you. So as you know, we talked last year about the social and emotional health of our students. And so just real quick, Tracy and I created a vision where we're looking to um, set goals, build the capacity by empowering our staff and our administrators that will enhance the social emotional um, tools that they have in order to better meet the needs of our students, right? To create safe learning environments, to develop relationships, get kids to be able to self-regulate so that ultimately they can access the learning environment. Should we next? Thank you. So the question is why do we why leverage the moment and invest in SEL? And the next, this slide and the next slide are research and um, data that supports, but um, ultimately there's never been a more urgent time to invest our energy in strategically teaching our students the aspects of social emotional health services, all right? Due to the effects of the pandemic, their loss, um, and everything that's going on. So, um, Tracy's going to go over the next slide. Three. So when, when we talk about social emotional health in general, we're really working off of uh, the CASEL model, which has five pillars to it. Um, and not everybody recognizes that it's, it's so comprehensive. And each pillar does have a diversity and equity piece to it. The first two pillars, self-awareness and self-management, have really to do, much like our JEDI work, an inside out, model where we need to learn about ourselves and understand our own workings of how we manage emotion before we can properly regulate ourselves and teach others. Then you get into the interpersonal um, facets of social awareness and relationship building. And when all that's working together and synergizing, you have responsible decision making with forth, with forth thought and also uh, understanding the concept of consequences. I'm sorry, just a quick question um, on that slide. Could you, uh, we talked a lot about, yeah, it's back to one, thank you, trauma-informed, our schools have done a lot of trauma-informed training. Where does that, just for the board's sake, where does that fit in? So, when we talk about trauma, we talk about self-awareness, it, it really encompasses all of it, and I think as we talk about the triangle, you'll, you'll see me break that down a little bit more. But when we talk about the science of trauma, we have to understand, um, not only what we've been through, but what our students have been through. And that's why right now leveraging the moment becomes so important because when you think about trauma, it's really about uh, intense loss of control, which is what we've all felt over the last year and a half. In March of 2020, when we all thought we were coming back to school on Monday or two weeks from then and then figured out none of that is in our control. We all lived through something. Um, and I think that coming back five days a week, not only are our staff feeling the impact of that um, loss of control and figuring out how to regain that, but as well as our students. So it really encompasses all that because if we're not self-aware, our self-management isn't there for ourselves or our students, and then it breaks apart 
the social relationships and those interpersonal skills. And then our decision making isn't on point. Um, we become very impulsive. Thank you. So we've created a shared approach to social emotional learning um, to follow, and it mirrors much of our MTSS processes. And the reason we did that is because we really felt when we, when we talked about the vision of social emotional health that it's got to be sustainable. So we worked really hard over the summer and throughout this, this year, we're going to be uh, doing a lot to beef up our, our green area, that triangle, our core supports, the base of social emotional learning. And those are the social emotional learning aspects that affect all of our all of our classrooms. And at the elementary level, that's leader and me. At the secondary level, that's restorative practices. As you move up the triangle to the to the, yep, to the yellow, you get uh, more targeted interventions. And that's uh, some of the things that all of our schools have access to are, are things like the idea of champs and achieve and positive behavior intervention supports, second step, and those types of things. When you talk about targeted supports, you talk about more group work um, where just whole class information isn't enough, so we've got to get more targeted. And then when you go up to the, the top tier of the triangle, Claire's going to get into that a little bit later um, as far as the detail of that, but that's our most intensive support. And again, it, it's a journey. It can't be in isolation, which is where you see the outer edges of that triangle. We've got to embed everything we do with social emotional health to our work with equity, relationships, and trauma-informed care. Trauma-informed care is the science behind everything on this triangle. So we've got to understand that. And work that we put in in 2018, 19, and 2020 before the shutdown, doing all that training with trauma and helping our staff understand their own trauma as well as that of our students and how that manifests in the classroom, that's all, uh, the science of that is what goes into leader me and restorative practices. And then the big paradigm shift is the outer triangle there where we've got to make sure that social emotional health and the teaching of that is not separate from what we do in the, in the classroom with curriculum. And so we've got to think about things like, is our instruction systematic and explicit? Do we have adequate skills to scaffold for our kids? And are we truly capitalizing on the personalized learning opportunities for our kids? Then you have the upper, the outer arrows and the, those outer arrows define our intervention, our BASD SAP process, and how we progress monitor. And so everything you do to access our tier two and tier three supports, or embed tier two and tier three supports down to tier one across all classrooms, it's, it's all based on information and data-driven processes through our BASD SAP program. Next one. So this slide just talks a little bit about some of the details that can go into tier one, two, and three. Um, it, it's not really as linear as it looks because depending on the needs of a school, you can always take tier two supports, build that capacity, and embed it across all classrooms if there's a need. Um, again, we, we talk about if the triangle's flipped to where the base and leader and man restorative practices isn't enough, you gotta beef up the, the base so that those targeted and those um, upper tier resources are really enough for students. So for example, zones of regulation, some buildings are using that as, a, as an additional school-wide that's implemented across the entire school, just like Leader and Me, it's another support. But in other buildings, they're using it as a tier two intervention, right? Targeting specific groups of kids or specific individuals or specific classrooms. That's where we've given the school some flexibility, we've given them that structure but instead, here's the, the, the minimum, and here are additional supports and tools that you have to better meet the needs of your students, because the staff and the administrators are there every single day and day out with the kids. So just to take that one step further, because we've talked a lot about this. So tier one is, it's good for everybody to do it across the school, the climate's embedded. But coming back to school now, we've seen a larger number of kids perhaps in Anticipate, we anticipate challenges, having a hard time getting back into the normal routine and, um, and being focused and behaving the way you want. So the school might say, as Claire said, you know, we're taking zones of regulation, which are specific lessons uh, for students, and we're doing it across the board right now, because everybody needs it right now. Um, and then in the long run, it would probably be a tier two, but maybe we need to do that right now. So this gives you the idea of how 
Uh, as you go up the tiers, the focus is on a smaller number of kids, but it's more intense. So if you think of the tiered approach, um, Tracy referred in, the tri in our triangle, the BASD SAP process. That is our process or a system to identify and document kids that need supports and, and the type of supports that they need. Just to kind of give you an idea of the number of students that go through the supports or go through the ASD SAP process. In 1920, at the end of when we left, March 13, 20, we had uh, 2,518 kids at that point in BASD SAP across from the district. At the end of last year, and we were in a hybrid situation and we had students in e-learning, our number was 2,345. So I share that with you as we have a lot of kids that are in need of supports. Right? Both academically, socially, emotionally, and behaviorally. So it's, in, it's critical for us to build the tools and the supports and the resources for our teachers to be able to meet the needs of our kids. The, the next two slides, we're not going to get in depth, but they're there as a resource for you all to just show an example of how you strengthen the core of that triangle. So I took one concept of trauma-informed practices, a part of, and, and how that correlates to, in this particular slide, leader in me, and that's the red text. So we're not gonna get into that, but just an idea of how we're creating sustainable practices in tier one, that everything we do, it fits into leader in me or restorative practices. It's not one more thing that we're just teaching in silos, but incorporating it um, straight through. Next slide. I think about when your kids are younger, and they're ready to have a meltdown or having a meltdown, you, you went through that cycle. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And if, if we um, are teaching things in silos for our teachers, then you, you don't get the sustainability or the teachers um, accountable or ownership to those tools, right? So it's important for us to embed. Um, Go ahead. Question. Is that, so when you're talking about explicit instruction, is that what you're referring to? Mm -hmm. So think of um, behavior and social skills as a, it, it's a skill, right? So academically, reading, writing, math, we teach those skills. Today, some of our students, a lot of our students, need that explicit instruction to the behavioral instruction, the social ex expectations, all right? So think of, um, it's the same. Behavior is a skill and therefore we need to teach and give those supports because we have high expectations for their behavior, their social skills. We have to give them those high supports through our, our skills. All right, next. Um, 11. Okay. So, what I wanted to share with you um, also in regards to our social emotional um, health services and learning is that we really have built up our community partners um, that really give us supports for t and, and how does that equate to our tiers? It really equates to our tiers two and tier three supports. And so as you can see, we have Time Broke Family um, Answers, which provides us social work services. We have communities in schools, which provides um, our integrated support services. The number six means that it's at six specific buildings. Um, we have St. Luke's, we have Lehigh Valley Hospital, and we have IU20 that are providing mental health behavioral health services, which is our outpatient clinics, all right? Um, we have United Way, and remember, at Saint, the outpatient clinics are in our, all 22 schools, because we've, we've achieved that. Um, the United Way is um, obviously very close partner with us, um, but really focuses in on our community schools. Um, we, have, we will have eight community schools at, um, this year. We're adding TJ Elementary School this year. Um, we also have Handle with Care, the Safe to Say, which the United Way has supported us with those um, initiatives. Um, St. Luke's also provides us the physical health services, all of our medical vans, 
all right? Our vision, our doctors that help support our physicals. Um, we also have Center for Humanistic Change the set, um, that comes in. They provide us SAP liaison services. They also provide us some small group um, programs um, that are preventive, that are considered to be preventive. They're trying to develop and provide the skills to the students to avoid situations. Um, they also have mental health screeners that we have access to. We also have after school activities through a variety of partners such as Moravian University and Lehigh University and CIS communities and schools. Um, as well as we've gotten, a, um, we've strengthened our relationship with Magellan, which is um, really o is the overseer for mental health services. Um, I sit on a bi-county uh, mental health collaboration committee that talks about the barriers and what we can do differently to access those. Um, we have Crimes Victims Council, Valley Youth House, um, the Bethlehem Health Bureau. So these are, we have additional community partners, but these are ones that we see day in and day out. All right, so I wanted to share that list. We've grown them dramatically. We, yes, we have. You know, from zero pine work social workers I don't know, five years ago, six years ago, five years ago, mm -hmm. we now have a bunch. Um, communities in schools, um, we continue to grow that up to eight. The uh, next slide, Claire will talk about the outpatient behavioral health. That was minimal through the IU 20. Now we have it all 22 schools. Um, so it's been dramatic. Both our district and the board supporting our investment in some of these, and then others are not at the district's expense because it's covered by health insurance or uh, medical assistance. So currently, um, just to give you an idea, the social workers, um, we have a total of 10 social workers right now, K through 12, that is um, providing supports to our students at the tier two level. Um, fingers crossed, we are, could very well increase that based upon another grant that we're waiting on. Um, so it would strategically provide um, a, num a number of social workers across elementary, across middle school, and across the high school level. And those are all, are they all through Pinebrook? Um, they will be all through Pinebrook except for two of them. Okay. So they're, yeah. they're not BASD employees? But Correct. All right. So we are contracting with them for that service. Um, so um, we have SEL behavioral coaches, which is new this year, um, that's helping Tracy and I to really enhance and give supports to build that capacity out in the schools. There's eight of those that we have. Um, they'll take more if we could give them more, but eight is good for right now. Um, so we've really built up, as Dr. Roy said, our, our supports and, and services through our, our partners. Next slide, Tracy, please. Which, again, I'm sorry, which is a main, which is a big reason why Tracy's position uh, is critical we have all these resources, we need to coordinate them and make sure they're focused and that we truly are building capacity with them. Have the partners struggled at all to, f to find the behavioral health support folks or uh, um, talk a little about that? I have to say, Craig, that um, Pinebrook has been very, very good at um, finding and, and maintaining their staff. I, they have lost staff that have left um, staff in that area, and same with IU20, St. Luke's, and Lehigh Valley, they have been able to maintain their staffing. Great. Right, so, our biggest challenge in this area is on the health, physical health side, with turnover with our nursing assistants yeah. and even our certified school nurses. Yeah. So it's just to, not uncommon, I guess. Yeah. So just to give you an idea, um, the number of students that were serviced just through the outpatient services. Um, you'll see Lehigh Valley Health Network is in nine of our schools. They serviced 138 students. St. Luke's is 72, and they're in 10. But keep in mind that last year we added the additional five. So getting the, the, the schools um, on, into the process. Um, so we anticipate that number will be going up. Um, IU20, who's in three of our schools, 140 students. Um, and then Community Voices, 
uh, clinic, which was operated through Lehigh at Dunnigan and Brockle, they saw a total of 23, that is grad students. That unfortunately is not operating this year. Um, but, you know, in, in some aspects I say, God, I think that those numbers are low um, when you think of the total number. But um, when I look at some of the barriers that we are struggling with, such as the insurance piece, right? Um, if they don't have MA and there's only MA available, we're working with parents to secure MA, we're parents refusing to access that, those services, so we're constantly working with the parents. Um, maybe it's a scheduling um, impact. The parent doesn't want the student to um, see the therapist during the school day. Um, and we work with the parents to say that's an advantage, that, that's why we have the services coming in. Um, so just some of the reasons why kids are, are uh, being referred or requesting to see is uh, pretty much self-harm, so there may be some self-harm, self-injury, there may be a traumatic event that has occurred, the pandemic has spurred um, you know, grief uh, of, and loss of individuals and um, that spurs you know, a traumatic event from in the past, anxiety, depression, eating disorders. Um, there's been some academic, how do I just manage the stress that I'm feeling? There's been some substance abuse. So there's a wide variety of the reasons for our kids to receive those services. Um, and then obviously we're seeing, our kids are primarily being seen in an individual capacity versus a group. There are some small groups if they're working on developing some skills, they'll bring, and they know that the kids, we, they could pair the kids into groups so that it's productive and it's beneficial versus just putting them in. Um, so last year we saw kids both in person and through telehealth, right? And they are continuing to do that this year based upon the, to meet the students' needs. This is tier three, the highest level of licensed professional therapeutic support. Correct. That's okay. beyond the, the social workers. Correct. And the, um, they will also do not just the counseling piece, but they'll also do med management, and there's other services that they can access through um, St. Luke's, Lehigh Valley, and the IU. All right. Um, next, this is just Tracy is keeping a nice uh, timeline just to see where things are going, so you can look at that at your leisure and see. Um, and then finally, what are our next steps? Our next steps are to support the paradigm shift, give our teachers and our administrators the, the support as we embed SEL in all that we do, as Tracy talked earlier about the academics through our BASD staff, um, our trauma-informed practices, and through our equity initiatives, and provide the supports ultimately we want our kids to be successful, right? So we're looking to expand our universal screener. We're doing a pilot at, in four schools um, we're looking to have that on a more consistent basis, so we'll see how that goes this year. And we're looking to work with our leadership teams to create the systems of sustainability for restorative practices and leader and me with our BAST SAP process. All right. So that kind of gives you a real quick a lot. picture. <laughs> it's a lot. Um, any questions, comments? So it's a big thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. So now we, we also, you can see we have the game plan, we have the framework that we can fit things in, that we've developed over time and really refined now. At first, when we were adding social workers, I feel like we were just, you know, throwing the, you know, plugging the dike. Um, but now, over time, we've developed, you know, the real model to go with it. So it's, it's outstanding. I hope that you guys sit in this. This is this is really good. This is really good. I, when we talk about educating the whole child, like this, this is good. This is good. This is what should be happening. There's so many folks do this. People complain about what's happening in the streets and why the young people do this. This, this is what folks should be doing. So, the district is, in my opinion, to be commended. For this. Very, thank you. We're very proud of you. Next up is 3.04 equity self-assessment. This is just a follow-up from what you remember last
last month when the board passed the, the new equity policy. Part of that policy, uh, which was a very robust and impressive policy, was for the district to uh, start doing some baseline equity audits and uh, self-assessment through the equity lens, applying that to the different parts of the organization. Luckily, uh, our district belongs as a district leadership forum for the Educational Advisory Board, EAB, and in your packet you see a uh, brief from EAB, which is basically what works uh, clearinghouse for school practice, uh, both academically and uh, social emotionally. And uh, you may also, uh, Dr. Beck Cooley may know EAB because they consult colleges on best practices as well. So we uh, are members of that and we're able to inquire of whether there are best practices for equity self-assessment and implementation. And uh, we found that there is and that starting very soon, uh, we'll be doing, following this model, to do a, a three-step, three-focus area assessment. One support, one area is supporting the basic needs of, of assessing technology and health supports, which you heard a lot about. So we'll be evaluating that through the equity lens. We'll be uh, evaluating establishing equitable educational environments and academic supports. And then three, using policies and partnerships to encourage college access and career readiness. That EAB document get, uh, walks us through different indicators, present, not present, and allows us to uh, begin the goal setting uh, process so that we have both goals and measurable standards by to see if those goals are being achieved. Uh, Vivian Robledo and uh, Rick Amato will be leading the, uh, the effort and they'll be developing the action plans and the goals and we'll be presenting uh, those action plans to the board at a future board curriculum meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No questions on that. Uh, we have an agenda item for the October 25th meeting. Uh, additional targeted support and improvement plans for freedom and liberty high school. Yeah, definitely this, not just the ATSI, which is the school improvement model from the state of Pennsylvania, PDE, give support to uh, secondary schools that uh, need additional support, but there was a second round of ESSERS funding which went to uh, helping ATSI schools with COVID-related expenses and how they could even uh, better meet the needs of the students. So, uh, Dr. Draper met with uh, the principals of Liberty and Freedom to see how they would want to spend the additional uh, ESSERS funds for the support of their plans. Uh, they have to be supported in two different areas, access to instruction and continuity of uh, pupil support services. Uh, all of that addressing the COVID related um, pressures on, on schools. And as you see in the attachment, um, as far as the filled out application, in terms of access to instruction, um, some of the funds will be used for providing more after school tutoring, uh, for purchase of instructional materials related to that, securing substitutes so staff can conduct learning walks to improve teaching practices that relate to the students' academic needs, and hire an additional English language learner instructional assistant because we never have enough language support for our second language learners. In terms of continuity of services, the schools will be looking at expanded mindfulness training, uh, implement the Check and Connect mentoring program or expand that, which already exists uh, for you, or at Liberty, and to uh, uh, sustain and expand the Wellness Center. As you remember, Dr. Bailey uh, was a pioneer in the Wellness Center at Liberty. Now, Mrs. Sage of Freedom is uh, moving forward on a very similar concept and using uh, the ESSER funds. So it's nice to get a windfall uh, when you were uh, not necessarily expecting it, but the needs are great. And uh, we'll put this on the agenda for your formal approval at the end of the month. No questions? We'll move to courtesy of the floor. Seeing none, uh, open forum. Okay, just mention a couple, couple of uh, items. Uh, <clears throat> first of all, COVID updates. Um, we're moving in the right direction slowly. So if I give you the total number of cases we've put on the dashboard over the first six weeks of school, starting with week one, we went 31 to 53 to 85 
That was the high point. And then 70, 57, and 48 last week. So 48 is still a lot. <laughs> I mean, um, it's, everything is uh, relative. Um, yeah. <laughs> and when we come down to um, today, we posted seven. And in the last Mondays, we've been posting um, you know, 19, 18, 13, 19, one, one uh, several weeks ago we had 30 cases. So seven is pretty low comparatively, and that's really, that's Saturday, Sunday, any Monday what comes into us. So that's a hopeful sign as well. Um, the, I, I wanted to mention that we're working on um, winter sports um, mitigation strategies. The state masking order um, requires masks in school, but specifically exempts sports, which doesn't make sense to us or to our healthcare partners or the Bethlehem Health Bureau. Um, so what we are able to do though, comp now compared to last year, is say we have kids who are vaccinated and we have kids who are unvaccinated. So we're working on a two-tier system, which probably next week I'll have the work, still consulting with St. Luke's and the Health Bureau, but um, looking at saying, look, if you're vaccinated and you're on the basketball team, um, you don't need to wear a mask inside. We're not quite there. I think that's where we're gonna end up. Um, if you are unvaccinated, you'll need to wear a mask, and we're looking at weekly testing as well. So we're trying to work, we have to partner with that, the group that the state is making available to all school districts for free. Um, it's been hard to get connected with them, but so that would be the idea of focusing testing on winter athletes that are indoors, unvaccinated, and they still would have to wear a mask indoors. Um, and so, because we know that there's a difference between being vaccinated and unvaccinated, um, and um, it could be uh, that, uh, so those are the areas we're looking at. I can tell you likely that other school districts are not gonna do this, I haven't heard anyone else talk, they're just gonna say, well, the state doesn't say you have to wear masks. I just feel that's, I don't feel that's appropriate for us. If we're gonna wear masks all day in school, in classes, how do we justify taking them off right after school? Unless you're vaccinated. Then I can see we'll make some accommodations um, for that. And knock on wood, a lot of our fall sports athletes are vaccinated and we really have had minimal, I mean, we've had some cases just because of the number of cases, but nothing that's been a major concern. I don't. I don't think we've had to, to put a whole team on quarantine um, this, again, uh, well, we might have with one middle school team, um, but not, not the other way. So it's been, it's been, been pretty good. Um, and, um, but going indoors, the, the, the anxiety level of the medical experts goes sky high. And so um, really requiring um, the vaccination, if you want to go maskless, is where we're headed. But I don't want to say for sure that's where that will end up until we finalize it. So that's kind of giving an incentive to get vaccinated. And if you choose not to, okay, well then we need to protect you and others and you have to wear a mask and get tested. So uh, more to come on that um, I hope next week. I think what we'll do is insert that into the, um, the uh, health and safety plan that the board approved in June, I think, way back in June, so that it's an official part of it. This is what we're doing, and indicates that it's the board support. Because I do anticipate we'll get some pushback from some folks on that. I think that's all I wanted to share publicly with you. Thank you. Well, I'll piggyback on that. Um, I see on our website there's a free COVID vaccine clinic at Dunnigan this Friday from 5 to 7. And then maybe we can get this on our site because there is one, a drive-through flu vaccine and COVID vaccine clinic Sunday, November 14th at the Freedom Place Yeah. Mm -hmm. so you can get that. Because you can just scan a code and get an appointment. We will definitely be pushing on that. Yeah. Um, Who's going to be there this year? Yeah, flu shot's important. Yeah. There's standard protection <clears throat> against COVID-2 on top by building with the flu vaccine. Um, Anything else? Um, Dr. Beckel. One question, just to piggyback on that. Um, as we're looking ahead to 
possibly getting vaccines approved for younger students. All of a sudden, I'm getting robocalls from our pediatrician's office just saying, we now have vaccines for 12 and up. That, that was like a few days ago. And so I don't know if networks of PD coming not just from their office, but from somewhere bigger that, that I'm not a part of, but just to sort of flag that, I don't know if any of our health partners are aware of any efforts to sort of collaborate through different pediatric offices, because if there's anything we can do to connect people to those networks or team up with that. And again, I don't know if anything's going on. It just was, was odd that all of a sudden something seemed to be ramping up that hadn't mm -hmm. ramped up yet. Maybe they're trying to get the 12 and olders. More it, was, to make it, yeah. it was, yeah, it was for the 12 There's a lot of activity in the FDA this month. They're meeting about a possible J&J &J booster, a possible Moderna booster, and yeah. possible approval for the 5 to 11. So it's a big, big, big month. Mm -hmm. Our plan will be to work with the city, to Health Bureau, to offer mm -hmm. immunization clinics uh, for uh, at the four at our four middle schools and covering different areas mm -hmm. of the district um, when the younger ones are approved and hopefully that will pull in the 12 and older as well. Okay. Okay. Uh, motion to adjourn. This is Patrick. Second. Uh, Dr. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.